Welcome folks. We're gonna get started in just a moment as people filter into the room here. Okay, I'm gonna kick us off. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Jess Del Fiaco. I'm the communications manager for the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, so happy to have you all joining us here today for our March science seminar. Thank you for choosing to spend uh, your early afternoon or morning, depending on where you are uh, with us. Um, before we kick things off, just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so please uh, ch uh, choose to turn off your video status uh, and mute yourself until we get to the Q&A portion of this event. Um, speaking of which, uh, we will have time for questions at the end of the hour, but please feel free to pop those in the chat uh, throughout the presentation today. Um, so we um, are collecting those along the way. Uh, before I turn things over to our speakers, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about uh, who we are. So the Midwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, or the Midwest CASC, as you'll hear us call it, um, is a partnership between a consortium of academic, tribal, and nonprofit institutions in the Midwest, um, which is hosted uh, at the University of Minnesota, where I'm based, um, working in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and we're actually part of a national network of these USGS uh, climate adaptation science centers, all of which uh, work to produce science which helps uh, fish, water, fish, wildlife, water, land, and people adapt to a changing climate. Uh, we accomplish this in several different ways. Um, we conduct synthesis research on regionally relevant um, topics. We support um, the next generation of climate adaptation scientists through programming for graduate students, undergraduates, and postdoctoral researchers. Um, we host um, these seminars and other workshops and events for our community. Um, and of course, uh, we fund climate adaptation research uh, with USGS. Um, I think with that, I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Alyssa, to talk about one of those events. Thanks, Jess. Hi, everyone, I'm Alyssa Welch. I am the program manager for the Midwest CASC based at University of Minnesota. And the slide you should be seeing right now is uh, promoting our annual gathering. This is the third annual gathering that the Midwest CASC will be hosting. And we are delighted to um, be welcomed into East Lansing by our consortium member East, I'm sorry, <laughs> Michigan State University. Uh, the dates of this year's annual gathering are August 13th through the 15th. And we've determined that um, there are several themes that uh, will be relevant to this year's annual gathering, where water meets the land uh, will be the primary uh, theme we'll be working from uh, and look forward to folks' interpretations of that as the program unfolds. Uh, we are excited to be welcoming for the first time research abstracts and session proposals um, through the link there. If you visit that website, you'll see a link in the middle of that page where you can fill out a very quick Google form uh, to tell us what your idea is and whether it's a, a session or a field trip or a poster that you'd like to share with us at the annual gathering. It is not a heavy lift kind of abstract proposal. Um, so keep that in mind, check it out. If you know you'll be joining us or you're interested, uh, we'd welcome those session proposals. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our two speakers today. First speaking uh, will be Althea Archer. Althea is a data visualization specialist in the USGS Viz Lab. She combines her passion for statistics, design, and reproducibility to create visualizations of water resource data that are effective and accessible. Her goal is to use data visualizations and science communication to educate the public about USGS water science. And our other speaker today is C. Nell. C is the lead of the Vision Analytics in the USGS Water Mission Area, where they lead a team that develops reproducible workflows, computational tools, and data visualizations to support information dissemination. They love working at the intersection of art and code in the name of science. 
I'm super excited to hear what our speakers have to say today. It super aligns with our CAST mission and what we're hoping to do. So take it away. Okay, thanks. I will share my screen now. And hopefully that worked. Um, got it? Yep, we got it. Does that look good? good? Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, thanks for having us uh, here to talk today. Again, I'm Althea Archer. I use she, her pronouns. And um, my visual description is I am a woman with brown hair, and I'm wearing a uh, black shirt with a mustard-colored cardigan. And I have long hair. And so we're with this USGS Phys Lab, and that's what we'll be talking about. Um, but first, I want to just kind of take a step back and take you all on a little bit of a journey. So um, we all love data, right? We're, we're here uh, talking about data viz because we like data and we spend a lot of time and energy collecting and analyzing data and it can really become dear to us on a personal level. Uh, but we also may recognize that our data is not all that compelling on its own. And the mere act of making it a data viz uh, like the scatter plot here of the same data I just showed you, doesn't really mean that it's all of a sudden engaging or compelling. In fact, it can really, data visualizations can actually be boring. In addition, climate and earth and environmental data is by nature extremely complex. So data visualizations can often be overwhelming, confusing, and still somewhat boring. So what can we do to really bring our data to life? So let's start here with this kind of different view of this data. It's um, as is, this is like maybe visually intriguing. You're kind of wondering what it is. So we first need to add some context. Get rid of that. There. Okay. Uh, so each bar is one stream flow drought. And the height of each is equal to the length of the drought. And the color indicates severity, which is a measure of how dry and how long the drought was. So that's great. But now we can also name this data with an event that's in our collective history, something that we've probably all heard of. And we can take this a little bit further. If I can get my button to go forward. I don't know why it's not advancing. Did it advance? There it goes. Okay. <clears throat> I missed wasn't slide. I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, we can add in stories that can relate. we can relate to on a human level. So here, this event starting in 1932, that, that red bar that that arrow is pointing to, was the most severe drought event on record during the Dust Bowl. It happened in the Red River of the North in Fargo, North Dakota, um, you know, close to the casks that were, that were, you know, the Midwest cask. And this river is known more commonly for its propensity for flooding. So it's surprise, surprising to hear that it was in this drought. And in this case, it was in severe stream flow drought that lasted over a thousand days. That's over three years long. Got to find my mouse again. There we go. Okay. And so finally, what if I personalize this data story with a quote? Dust to eat and dust to breathe and dust to drink. Dust in the beds and in the flower bin, on dishes and walls and windows, in hair and eyes and ears and teeth and throats, to say nothing of the heaped up accumulation on floors and windowsills after one of the bad days. So by enriching these data with first details about how to understand what you're seeing, layered with specifics about the data, and ultimately by including the humanized story, we can really bring data to life. And so that's what we did with this website here. So this is an actual screenshot. Oh, I might have to play it. No, it's playing. Of um, a website that we just released this last year where we use narration and human-led stories based off the data that I just demonstrated. And so again, here you're looking, you can see the context related to the data itself. And also you can see that humanized uh, story elements like the quotes that relate to this, all the, these uh, individual drought events that have happened in the last 100 years. All right, so with that, I wanna take a little bit step back. So we're talking about engaging our audiences today. And often, if you go to a, a storytelling workshop or something like that, you'll hear that good stories involve emotion change or challenge, and that good stories are relevant to the message you're trying to communicate. So when it comes to data viz, that 
means that good stories can connect your audience with the data. And so that's what we're all about at the USGS Viz Lab. So we um, are a team, a fairly small team in the USGS water mission area. And everyone on our team has core data science skills, but we also all bring other skills to the table, such as domain knowledge in ecology, forestry and hydrology, and expertise in information design, cartography, front end web, web development and science communication. And together, our mission is to bring USGS water science to the public through timely, usable, and engaging data visualizations. So I wanna first talk about the beginning of this, where we're saying that we bring USGS water science to the public. So in this role, I like to think of us as sort of scientific translators. Scientists are ex experts at collecting and analyzing data, but they're not often trained in science communication. And this can hinder the ability for the general public to understand the main takeaways from research, even if it's very important, such as research related to climate change and natural resources. And so what we do as science translators is we use data visualization, science communication, and visual storytelling to bring your science to the broader American public. So here's one example of this. So this is an actual um, data visualization that's in a manuscript. And this manuscript is related to drought and the methodology behind modeling drought. And this is publication figure has a lot of information in it, is somewhat esoteric in the way that things are labeled. Um, and it's visually fairly complex. It's also written specifically in um, for an audience that's very motivated to be reading. You're not going to read a scientific paper unless you're motivated to do that, right? You're not going to just casually happen to read a whole scientific paper about drought, probably. So we know that this audience is already motivated to learn about drought. And it also is following this like print format, following journal recommendations or requirements for the way the, the plots are laid out and how labels are put on them and, and the caption and such like that. On the other hand, we can have one that the USGS Viz Lab has created. Um, and this specific instance here, I created this one to be a standalone explainer that really explains the same concepts that are in the scientific paper publication on the left. But here it's drawn in more of a modern, accessible, highly designed way with things that are directly labeled. And it was made with uh, principles of plain language so that these kind of fairly complex um, scientific concepts are actually spelt out uh, and accessible. And we like to think that this audience for this would be anyone. So it still may be helpful for educators or researchers to understand um, some of the metrics of drought, like du duration, intensity, and severity, but it could also be written for um, students in middle school classrooms, for instance. Okay. So to do this scientific translation well, we really need to understand the target audience by asking who they are and what do they already know, and really what do they not know. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to understand your audience, and we're just going to go through a couple of the things that we ask when we're talking about our audience. Education is one of the easiest things to really look at. If we're talking about the general public as our audience, it's important to know that average Americans read at a 7th or 8th grade level and that 62% of the public has an education level less than a bachelor's degree. We can also think about the motivations behind our readers. You know, are they reading this website or this article or reading this tweet that you put out on social media for professional or personal reasons? So in the previous example, we already talked about this a little bit. You're not gonna read a scientific paper unless you're really highly motivated to do so. Otherwise you might, skip straight to a news outlet or social media to read about drought. Along with this, it's important to question if your audience already cares about the topic or if one of your main communication goals is to get folks to care in the first place. So that means that you have to, you know, probably add in some sort of personalization, such as the quotes um, or place-based stories, um, like we talked about in the drought example earlier, and those help actually get your audience to care from the get-go. And then finally, I am not an anthropologist, but I do know that there's been a lot of work regarding cultural norms or frames of reference that we all carry with us and how they inform the ways in which we relate to science stories. In our case, when we're building social media content, 
It's really important to remember that not everyone will appreciate or understand the same pop culture references, idioms, or turns of phrase. However, they can often be useful when we are sharing out information on social media. So this is an example of using a cultural frame of reference to our advantage. This is a really cool data viz that Elmira on our team made that loosely follows a pop cultural reference. Um, and this connection improved the success of this particular data viz on social, social media with a lot of folks creating their own spinoff viz for their own areas or stream gauges. So it's really important to also do research to understand your audience, their motivations and their frames of reference. This could be as simple as watching what tweets or posts get the most clicks, or it could go all the way to actually doing user-centered design research. So as an example, uh, to help make our products more useful, we're really integrating user-centered design into our approach and particularly through the development of the new water cycle diagram that we just released. We really wanted to make sure that our diagram was usable, especially in education settings. So we spoke with teachers who use the USGS water cycle diagram throughout the design process, incorporating their feedback as we went. And now that we know more about our audience, we can talk about design and designing for understanding. Our goal again is to effectively, effectively communicate science for as many people as we can. So first we could talk about flow. Confusing flow can make a reader question whether they're lost, and if they feel lost, they probably are lost. So when you make a data visualization with a clear flow, F for flow, then you get a starting point for the eyes, which is usually in the upper left for us English speakers, and then it kind of follows the shape of a flow, of a F for flow. The F shape helps you um, get that structure that helps us make our way through the data visualization and know where to read next. It's also critical to consider the visual hierarchy of the information being presented. What I mean by this is that we must think carefully about the order in which elements attract our attention. So with good visual hierarchy, people's eyes will naturally go to the most important information first. And as designers, we can tweak things like style, weight, or color to make certain elements more prominent and other elements less prominent. So what does this look like with graphics or more complicated uh, data visualizations like maps? We've got this slightly ridiculous fake map here of where dead bodies were found after a series of murders. At the moment, the design is what we call flat. Everything is competing for your attention and it's really hard to figure out what the different lines mean. So now, while this fake map is still not necessarily pretty, with this visual hierarchy tweaked, it is much easier to understand. And suddenly what pops is the important, albeit morbid, information, which is the location of those bodies. Visual hierarchy is at the forefront of our mind when we start designing any data viz, but it was especially so when we began the process of redesigning the original USGS water cycle diagram, which is shown here. So given how much information we need to impart with this, we wanted to make sure we visualize, visually de-emphasized anything that was not of key importance. So in the end, we are inspired by landscape architecture diagrams that use a grayscale color palette except for water features. Because this diagram is about water, and because water is associated with blue, and because blue is a cool color that gets pushed to the background when paired with other colors, we made blue the only color used. This helps us make the information digestible and easy to follow. Your eye is drawn first to the water, just like we want, and then the labels and arrows, and then at your leisure, you could explore the background content in the grayscale. We also think carefully about visual hierarchy and our data visualizations. So on the left, we have a series of small multiple maps. The title is in the upper left because our eyes tend to go there first. Think of that flow F letter. And then each of the, each of the small multiple maps uses a light to dark color ramp. So since the maps are on a white background, it's the dark values that pop which really emphasizes where each type of water use is dominating in the country. On the right, we have a visualization on a dark background. Here, instead of emphasizing one end of the color ramp, like the high values, we actually want to emphasize areas of both high snow color cover and low snow cover. So we used a ramp where the two ends pop, while the middle is close to the background color. 
One fundamental step to improve the accessibility of designs is to check the contrast of text and key design elements against the background color. So there are web content accessibility guidelines that lay out contrast ratio standards for text and key visual components. So for text, we want a 4.5 to one contrast ratio. So you can see here that the aliens on the right, the two aliens on the right would be adequately high enough contrast ratio for text elements. Um, for large text like titles and for um, like essential components of graphs, you can actually go down to a three to one contrast ratio. And so the alien in the middle would also be adequate for that. Um, and then you can see that these two dark alien heads on the dark background do not have high contrast and would not be suitable for a database. And simply viewing your design in grayscale can also be a really good check to see if the contrast is sufficient and if your visual hierarchy holds up. So again, these are the same small multiples. In the, on the right, they're shown in grayscale. And you can see that even in grayscale, because each map is individually labeled, um, and the dark values still show where those regions are dominant on each map. Okay, and here's another example with the data visualization. So Mandy on our team who designed this data viz that's on the far right, could have chosen colors that were less contrast or had less contrast like the other two examples. But if you compare these, you really can see that the one on the right is the easiest to read and really has the the best visibility and contrast. So in addition to color and contrast, direct labels are also a really important aspect of effective data visualization. Here, there are many colors and they vary in shades and hue quite a bit, but the real test again is to, to see how this looks in grayscale. In grayscale, you can see that some of the colors would be hard to tell apart, but they're, not only are the individual groups of cubes separated out to help differentiate them, they're also directly labeled. This helps us ensure that this is a readable chart, even with various color blindnesses um, or um, situations of low vision, or even if this was printed in black and white. And color selection is critically important. Um, you really should consider the colors, you, if the colors you are using are colorblind friendly, especially if distinguishing between colors is critical for understanding your data viz. And if you're using a continuous color ramp, you should be sure that the color ramp emphasizes what you want it to be emphasizing. So there are a lot of great online resources in picking colors for data viz, and these are just a few examples. And then again, um, we do post a lot of our data viz on social media. And it's really Im important to remember your audience and always uh, add alt text to your data viz. Uh, we spend a lot of time curating our tweets, making sure to include alt text that communicates the key messages of our viz, capitalizing words and hashtags, and using plain language wherever we can. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it to C. Awesome, thanks, Althea. I'm just gonna switch and share my screen here. You seen it? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, okay, thanks, Althea, for kind of walking through some of the thought process that goes into how we design our visuals. And so in this next part, I'm just going to walk through a bunch of examples um, and kind of the points that we were thinking about when we were developing them. Um, pretty much all of these examples that I'm going to show you are available in our online portfolio, which is at this link above labs.waterdata.usgs.gov slash visualizations. Um, I hope you will check it out. Uh, because there's a lot more there also than I'm going to show right now. Um, and so as we go through it, I'm kind of break it down into these four kind of different types of visualizations going from, you know, mo most simple to maybe more complex, uh, that's static, animated, narrative, and interactive data viz. Um, and this, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do here, but this is just kind of a nice way to frame it and think about how we can share some of these with you. So first, um, thinking about static, this is just, you know, any sort of figure, image, diagram, uh, one graphic. And, you know, while maybe a static, a static data visualization may be more simple um, than other types like interactive or animated, that's actually, you know, what I find to be the power in this type of visual. So looking here, we're uh, looking at the uh, climate stripes, for example, where it's showing for each bar, it's showing uh, temperature in the US since 1985. And, you know, this is a really, really simple data viz where, 
you can just look at it and you see increasing from left to right, you know, it goes from blue to red. Um, and it's really compelling, you know, there's only minimal labeling on it, but you get this really strong takeaway message. Um, and I think this is a really great example of the power that a static data visualization can have, you know, um, now we see this, this same visual, you know, all through culture, it's like, you know, in art exhibits, it's um, in the news, people are knitting different patterns, there's dresses in fashion week. And so it's just had this really high impact on how we think about climate. Um, and even now, you know, in the most recent IPCC report, this graphic has been brought in and adapted to show the different possible scenario, future scenarios um, under cl climate change. Uh, so that's a really great impact to have with this really simple visual. Um, here's, and so some of these, a lot of these examples I'm gonna show they're from our team, but also from our group of collaborators too, because we do work widely with everybody and we're always excited to learn and collaborate with different people across the water mission area. So Althea showed this one earlier. This is made by Mandy Carr, who's on our team. Um, and you know, what I really like about this one is that it tells a lot in the single graphic, right? With the annotations there with the arrows, we're adding in different levels of context. And on the right, that column on the right side where you see hydropower, wind, solar, bioenergy, and geothermal all broken out into those little tiny facets uh, to really highlight, you know, that one specific trend against the group is a really compelling way to be able to show, like layer in a lot of different information and highlight different aspects of the visual. Um, another way that we try to add context into graphics is using, you know, illustrations or icons. So here, you know, this chart is showing the number of or the population within certain distances from stream gauges across the US. And so just in a really simple way um, with Sam, we added the, the little per walking person, the bike icon and the car to represent like, you know, comparative distances that somebody might be from it and add this context that makes it a little bit more relatable and understandable to uh, public audience. One thing that we really like to do on our team is incorporate elements of illustration as well, um, just to be a little bit artistic and have fun with it, but also to be able to like, again, add context. So in this chart, you're looking at a time series um, of drought that's reconstructed. And one thing that I really love about this is Elthea has figured out this way to programmatically incorporate illustrations into the chart. So you're seeing those uh, six different flowers on the bottom right corner that represent different regions. Um, and then that's paralleled in the chart. So we can see kind of like where the regions appear, but really it just creates this sort of beautiful uh, image of a field of flowers, which makes you know something like drought that's not that happy, a little bit more pleasant. Um, again, you know this this is a visual that was made by Althea, where she adopted this comic book style to be able to layer in a story and have this like cute little squirrel telling you about you know how much. Uh, shade from urban trees is saving an energy um, in, the, in the tree there. And so that tree is actually using the same approach of uh, incorporating illustrations where each of the flowers are sized by the total amount of energy savings uh, for major cities across the US with uh, Los Angeles having the highest. And then on the right, um, the average water savings by state using this kind of like raindrop effect. So then you're just like kind of paralleling things that we associate with these different topics, but making a little bit more fun uh, to be engaging and bring in different audiences. Okay, so moving to animated. Um, okay, so animation is one of kind of my favorite approaches for data viz. Um, you know, right? We're just talking about any sort of moving image. Could be a GIF, could be a video. But animation is a really great way to layer in complexity um, and build kind of like a story within a single graphic, right? It often works really well with time. Like we're looking at this global temperature change uh, polar chart on the right, where each of the lines there is drawn, you know, in sequence through time. And so just adding the animation there where you see the lines build out and change in color, you really take away like strongly, you know, that uh, temperature is changing. We're getting closer to that 1.5 degrees Celsius um, from the baseline. And so we've used this in a bunch of ways in our work. Um, this is a chart that was made by Caitlin Andrews uh, and with help from Mandy Carr. And so this one, is it playing? This one is just showing summer water temperatures in Lake Powell, um, where we're using an animation across time because there's kind of that natural parallel with like there's time in an animation, right? But just showing how the temperature profile is changing as the water levels change um, and what that means uh, across like the miles away from the dam. Uh, 
Uh, and this this is another data viz that we actually put out last week, um, and we built it in a reproducible pipeline so it can be regenerated and run um, at any time point. So this is working with the US um, National Ph Phenology Network showing the timing of leaf spring out across, or of spring leaf out across the contiguous US. So uh, one thing also I wanna highlight here is like we often like to parallel these animations or data visualizations that connects like a chart and a map. So you can see both the temporal and spatial um, context as it goes through. And so I think that one works really nice here in this animation where you see, you know, as that bar chart builds on the bottom, the colors in the bar chart also parallel, you know, the color bands in the map and we can see how spring is slowly creeping across the country. And this is actually a chart that was um, long listed for the information is beautiful awards last year, which was really great to get recognition for that. A, sounds a little bit dark, but um, another, another great example here of a pair chart and map is this, uh, this wildfire map made by Anthony Martinez. And so what you're looking at is like, as it animates through time on the map, there's like these little glowing like fireflies where each of the fires were burning during that time. And it's a really cool way to kind of like parallel, you know, what is the interpretation of this map with this, these like fire-like uh, animations above. Okay, so this next group um, is using narrative. And this isn't, narrative isn't necessarily its own data visualization. Like, you know, it can be folded into any sort of data this product in a variety of ways. Um, and this is an area that we've been really thinking a lot and thinking about how do we bring storytelling into our work? How do we provide some sort of explanation or story that contextualizes the data and also allows the user to like build um, an increasing complexity as they navigate through it. So the animation you're looking on the slide here is a cool example about it where it's, uh, walking through different climatic changes and it's like paralleling this are, are you my mother story um, and as the user scrolls down the page you know different animations are triggered and different uh, different data is drawn on the chart and so in the most basic way that we add narrative into our products we might like we see in this just use uh, plain language explanations of the charts and you know breaking it down into the key different pieces uh, to take the audience through it Right, so this, this is from a website that we made about um, how do we predict stream temperature in the Delaware River Basin, um, where we're using a lot of annotations and using animation to slowly pace the story for the audience. Because it is, if you go to this site that's linked here below, it is actually a pretty complex story that where we build up to like, how do we use machine learning to predict stream temperature? Um, and it, it required to be able to reach this general public audience, like a longer backfield to get into the data and complexities of that story. Um, this is another site that was actually nominated for the Information is Beautiful Awards long list last year. Uh, and this was led by Althea. So this site, what is Streamflow Drought? It uh, uses a scrolly telling approach. So scrolly telling being the combination of like scrolling and storytelling. Um, and we this is a pattern that we like to use a lot where you know you start with maybe a static image. And as the, the user scrolls down the page, it updates and slowly builds the story. And what's what's great about this is like, you know, we're in control of the story that we want to deliver to the audience, but the audience or the user is in charge of like the pace that the information is brought in. So here we're just starting with, you know, like these illustrations that break down from normal to streamflow drought. Um, and then the, first a simple chart appears. Um, and then again, like layering on these different, uh, data points that tell you, you know, how could you measure streamflow drought using USGS stream gauge data. And that's kind of the main takeaway from that site. A newer style that we're, we're currently developing the site uh, that is not yet out um, is personification and like these using these cartoons to tell a story about climate. So this page is about trout and how body size and temperature are related. Um, and and so it uses these two fish, Mike and Barry, that you see on the screen here. This again is sort of like a scrolly telling navigation style where it's gonna walk through a story um, and the two characters like tell you a little bit about and connect you to the science, uh, different data, data visualizations appear. And one thing that we're experimenting with in this, in this project is to use like more of a choose your own adventure style where the user gets to make decisions um, and navigate through the story and that ultimately is going to influence like what they get away from it. Okay, so the last category I have here is interactive. 
Um, and interactive can be a lot more complex to develop and often incorporate higher levels of data because it does allow the audience to have a certain level of exploration and discover the story on their own. Um, it also creates opportunities to personalize a story to an individual. Like maybe you can go to a map and see where, you know, check out your location and see how that looks into the con within the context of like the broader data set um, or change out different variables uh, like you see in this animation here that's coming from the IPCC interactive report. Um, and in our work, you know, we are often focused on reaching public facing audiences. And so we, you know, there's a lot of ways you could approach these interactive visualizations, but our approach is to create like a tailored interactive experience where we're not giving the audience all of the data, but a few different options that all kind of fit the message that we're trying to communicate. Um, whereas like on the other end of the spectrum, you might get things like data explorers or large scale mappers that do a really great job at delivering like large quantities of data and giving the user a lot to look into. Those are really excellent. And I know there's a lot of people that are really good at making them, um, but because we, in our work, we're focused on kind of like this public, maybe non-technical audience, we find that creating this more tailored experience reaches that goal for us. Okay, so these graphics are just um, kind of a simple example of that from a recent website that we made uh, about bottled water facilities across the United States. And so these are just two kind of the two of the interactive features that are on that. First, we have this bar chart where there's an interaction that allows the user to select, you know, are you seeing the total number of bottled water facilities or beverage, beverage facilities or uh, switching that between like the proportions. And we felt like both of those were important uh, messages to communicate. So we, we use this interaction to be able to let the user toggle it. And then on the right, what you're seeing is a screenshot of a interactive map where the user can select the different state or highlight on the bar chart um, on the bottom, bottled, bottled water facilities, breweries, distilleries, and see the map update to show that different information there. I'm um, going back to a style that I highlighted a little bit earlier. You know, we do love having these like map and chart paired interactions or animations. So what you're looking at here is um, a map of the Delaware River Basin, all the river reaches on the left-hand side. And then the right is a time series chart showing uh, the average stream temperature at all the river reaches on the map uh, throughout a year. And so as in the site, you know, as you go a mouse over each of the months, it highlights on the map the average, the average stream temperature for that month. And so when you look at it together, it kind of has this really cool glowing effect that I love. Um, this is another type of paired chart, you know, map interaction that we use in that recent drought timeline site that Althea shared a little bit earlier, where um, in this map in the center of this polar chart, if the user highlights over one of the ind individual areas, it shows patterns in drought frequency um, for that specific region, like both in the polar chart and then the chart on the right. Uh, to just allow the audience to have like a little bit of a tailored exploration of like what do these different regional patterns look like in addition to the you know large uh, historical timeline that's provided earlier in the site. Um, okay, this, this is from a really cool site that we, I think actually was in collaboration with the Midwest CASC. We're looking at um, walleye and bass under different climate scenarios. And so this is a cool chart uh, that where it allows the user to draw a line and guess, you know, like what do, we, what do you expect this pattern to be like for walleye versus uh, bass that's originally on there. And when we did this, uh, we actually collected the data on all the lines that people guessed. And so what you're looking at here are all the possible guesses that people made for the walleye, which was kind of a cool way to like get, get the audience engaged and like thinking about like, what, what does this look like? Okay, so for this last part, I just want to highlight one of the pages. Um, this, this is a site from Snow to Flow uh, that got the, was the winner for the Shoemaker Communication Excellence Award last year in the website category. Um, this is one of the first sites I made uh, in my role as a data specialist at USGS. And so when we were making this site, you know, it was maybe like January, 2021 uh, and the inspiration for it was just trying to think about, you know, what are the important water issues that we want to be talking about at this time? And it being January, you know, the next kind of major event that I saw was snow melt melting and entering the water cycle. And so thus we were thinking about this project idea here. 
Um, similarly, you know, we were in the depths of the pandemic at that time point. And uh, one thing that, you know, stuck in my mind was that this like flatten the curve chart was that was so widely seen on the internet, you know, actually did a really great job of explaining, you know, differences in these two curves and interpretation, like increasing generally the public's literacy on how to read this type of chart. And I thought that might be a cool thing to play on because it allowed us to talk about uh, snow melt in a way that maybe we wouldn't have been able to do before this chart became so popular. And so creating this site, um, I kind of did this play on it where throughout the site, we're looking at both snow, snow melt and stream flow uh, with snow always being in gray and stream flow always being in blue and comparing high and low uh, snow years to see what that would look like. So looking at this, it's a little bit different, but you can see kind of that high and low curve, just like the flatten the curve um, in this chart. And in developing this site, you know, we use a pretty intentional narrative structure to be able to build in the story. And so it starts with a big splash, like a visual hook, that animated animation that you saw a minute ago. Um, and then there's four main sections that have a repeated structure. And so I'm showing an example, one on here on the right, where it's like, it starts with a big image and with a title, there's maybe a text section, there's some sort of data viz chart with a caption, and then often buttons to explore more and get more info about the topic. And so in each of these sections, we repeated the concepts of snow melt and stream flow, always using those same two colors to represent them. Uh, we always hit on the timing and magnitude of snow melt and stream flow uh, and parallel that across each of the sections. And then we're using this comparison of high and low snow years uh, to reinforce that. And so this is sort of um, on the left here, you're looking at what those four different sections were kind of like the data viz that were in each of them. But as we go from the beginning to the end, the idea is that it increases in complexity. Um, in the beginning, we start with some diagrams that just introduces the concepts. Uh, then we bring in some data to, to like reinforce that using a scroll triggered animation. Um, the next section adds spatial scale and a little bit of interaction. And then the last part is a little bit more of user explanation, uh, exp has a little bit more user exploration and increases the spatial scale that we're at. I was just gonna, I think I have it. Can you see that? Okay, so this is what that site looks like. Again, we have this big splash with this kind of like fun effect. Uh, with the clouds to just draw in the audience um, and pull them into it. And then we start the story about snow melt in the West. Uh, and then again, in the first section, we're using these illustrations that are just like conceptually introducing what are we talking about with snow melt, stream flow, uh, at timing and magnitude. And so this goes through, you know, what a normal year we might expect, a high snow year, and then a low snow year. Um, and then in the next section, bringing in actual data, right? So we, we're using this animation to draw the time series. This is the snow, here's the corresponding stream flow, and this is a high snow year. And then again, the same thing paralleled with the low snow year. Um, this next section is kind of fun where, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this, I think, without that buildup, right? Where we're seeing the exact same graphic, but now we've added a large number of sites that original, the previous chart was just a single site. And so here we're looking at a number of sites and by pressing these different buttons, the chart reorganizes um, to show across sites, you know, the differences in high and low snow years, uh, you know, what that looks like as far as timing, where you can kind of see by the, having these two parallel X axes, you can see, you know, with like the lower snow year, things are happening earlier and this, the melt period is longer. And then it adds in kind of this new dimension of elevation where we can see that these patterns also vary with elevation. And the last section, which I'll leave you to explore on your own for the year that we published this, uh, when you mouse over different snow tail sites in the West, it's showing you the same um, melt and magnitude variables that we use throughout and showing a longer time series for each of those. And again, this is what our this is what our portfolio site looks like. So if you want to check out any of these things, uh, they are all linked on here. Okay, and then that's it. Um, so we're happy to take any questions.
uh, from all of you. Thank you. We've gotten a few in the chat already. Um, I can go ahead and read read one off to get us started. Um, from Catherine, we have, I was wondering about the choice to use handwritten style text versus typical text and text choices in general. Um, I know there is some discourse about serif versus sans serif fonts. I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, okay. <laughs> I think, you know, one thing that we've tried to incorporate as like our signature style is when we want to add annotations, um, we like to use like more of a handwritten font, just so, sort of like somebody's drawing on the chart and, you know, it's like adding this extra detail um, that maybe is like secondary to kind of like the caption or the description of it. I do think there are a lot of decisions to make when you are thinking about text though, like certain fonts are, are have been shown to be just more accessible, like uh, Source Science Pro is like maybe one of our default ones. That's actually people have done studies on it that show that it, for those that that are dyslexic, it's it's easier to read. Um, and there are a couple other in that others in that category. And so I think there's a balance that of that with the scripting fonts because some of those can be a little bit over the top and harder to read. And so we always want to be conscious about that. Um, I generally feel like sans serif fonts. I I find them a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, but at the same time, I think part of our style is to embrace kind of like diversity and design too. So we do like to mix it up. Right, thanks. Uh, I've got another one, which is asking about the origins of the Viz Lab itself. Um, you guys are embedded in the water mission area of the USGS. Um, why there and not in communications? Yeah, that's a good question, honestly. <laughs> you know, okay, so the origin of our team, um, we're in the data science branch at, in the water mission area. And so, you know, there was a, the previous, the when the data science branch was started, um, you know, the staff were really skilled and motivated to build out this capability in data visualization. And so that was the origins of it, like people kind of doing it on the side of other work and it had a lot of success, you know, like I see some of the comments about putting things out on social media, um, getting picked up by the Washington Post. And so that's really allowed this group to grow. Um, and so, you know, we do actually do a lot more communication stuff now than, than that originally. And so we are collaborating a lot with like our web communications branch. Um, Mandy, who's on our team is, we consider her like our storyteller and she does a lot for communications with the web communications branch and OCAP as well. So we, we do have those connections um, and we do like working with topics outside of water as well, to be honest. Um, but that's, we kind of like hold this foundation around like data viz being a, a like core component of data science and that's our home being in the data science branch. Thanks. Um, we've got one question that I see has a lot of thumbs up. So we'll go to that. Um, what platform or tools do you use to make all of these visualizations? Is it a lot of different things? Is it combinations of things? Um, do you have one go to? Um, and then one follow up question is, is the source code for some or all of these published online? You want to take that one, Althea? Yeah, yeah I'm, um... The short answer is that it depends on what we're doing, um, but we tend to, um, for like all our static data visualizations tend to be in R, sometimes Python, depending on who we're collaborating with. Um, and then a lot of times what we try to do is make our websites as reproducible as we can, which means we use R to create the data visualizations and then uh, use Vue and Vue.js and um, D3 or whatever to like pick up the data or pick up the data viz and put it onto the website. Um, and we do share our code out like uh, that drought timeline website, for instance, at the bottom of that website, you can click on the little GitHub link and it'll take you to our archived code repository for all the data, for all the code. So that's including website build code as well as the actual data visualization code in there in R. Um, and in addition to that, we do have a blog. I was just going to pull up an example blog where we also uh, code in the open, so to speak, and we share out reproducible examples of data viz on there and some like tips and tricks for data viz on our blog as well. 
And did I miss anything? See, feel free to jump in. There's a question that's a little bit related, I think, um, in terms of it talking about process. And it's asking, how long does it take your team to develop these visualizations from the static charts to the interactive story type visualizations? I guess, how different are those timelines? Yeah, there's a lot of variability. Um, you know, it really depends too, like we're often collaborating with outside projects. So it also depends on where they're at in their process. Some projects will start with, really early on and be there in the beginning. And so it might be, you know, a year or even longer um, because we're waiting also for them to publish, you know, like maybe papers or the data releases that, and the interpretive content that we're using database to elevate. Um, but if, you know, say everything's ready to go, the data sets are published, uh, I, like a static graphic could be anywhere from like one day to a week or maybe a couple weeks, depending on the complexity. Um, I think animations in a similar realm. And then those interactive pages often take much longer, like on the magnitude of months. Um, the snow to flow one, I think we did that one in about two and a half, three months. And that was uh, with a couple of people working most time on it because there's, you know, there's like the website development side of it. Uh, there's a lot of testing and making sure we're meeting like the accessibility requirements that we need. Um, and then there's also, you know, with everything there's FSP review that, there's often a couple of rounds of. Um, here's a question that I, I know it's something that I have struggled with, and I think it's a common kind of tricky, tricky problem for folks. Um, and it is any tips for deciding how to prioritize information when communicating science? Um, it seems there are a lot of intentional decisions about which information to prioritize um, and what might get glossed over by readers. Um, when you're designing. Um, but scientists are often excited about all of it and uh, it can be hard to make those decisions about what to prioritize. Any recommendations? Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so the way that we work with our you know, teams of subject matter experts. Um, so for example, if a team comes to us and says, we just were publishing this really awesome research related to this thing and we have all this data and we want to you to tell our story through data visualizations, we start with a brainstorming meeting where we really try to parse out the main actual science takeaways um, and try to really identify only a couple of those. And that's one of those places where the scientists want every bit and piece to be a key takeaway. And we often say, okay, let's, let's just try to pick three top ones. And then it's really also important at that same step to think about who the audience is. Um, and so for the example that C shared with the little fish that are drawn, um, that's one where, you know, eventually that scientist team wants to do more of an in-depth data visualization down the road. But right now they were trying really hard to just reach the folks on the land in that area of the U.S. who fish and, and you know, don't have a scientific background. And so they really liked our kind of approach to really boil down the science and personify it in order to try to connect to that specific audience. Um, and so it really depends on the project, but we try to come up to consensus with this like brainstorming, interactive brainstorming um, session that we have from the get-go. Um, how are design and visual artists credited in this work, especially if incorporated into peer-reviewed publications? Um, I think it depends on the scenario. We don't often, one of the things we don't do is data visualizations for publications as a general rule. Um, so that doesn't really come up that often. Um, we, you know, if we have data visualizations published through the USGS Drupal site, our names are associated with those. Like you could look up one of our staff profiles and find the data viz that we've collaborated on. And then we're just like on our websites, we have an authorship statement that explains who contributed, including subject matter experts and who did what and what they do. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any other answers to that C that you can think of. All right, well, we are getting it, to the end of our time. Oh, go ahead, see. Yeah, see, it's it's sort of hard. Uh, in some cases, we are working with SPN to get like a DOI, but that's only possible for certain types of products. Um, yeah. 
actually. Um, so we are getting to the end, end of our time. Uh, and I think I got to most questions. Um, if I've skipped yours, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, related to that, uh, is there a way that folks could get to know you more in addition to following your blog and social media? Do you ever do other presentations or trainings um, on, in this content area? Yeah, okay. we're, we're really happy to engage with people. I think we get our best ideas um, by interacting with people across USGS and learning about the different science. You know, that's how we find new projects is like learning about what you, you all are doing. Uh, one thing I'll say is like Althea leads our design our design studio meeting and it's essentially like a design critique where a group of people get together and take turns sharing stuff that they're working on and giving each other feedback it's really low stakes and once a month uh it's open to anybody that wants to attend um, and share something that they're working on we're also actively developing a training course um, communicating science through data visualization that will be like tool agnostic and then also with sort of like a our based component that you could also take with it. And so we're developing that this year and I think probably next year that'll be available um, through DOI Talent. And we're gonna be at Water SciCon in mm -hmm. June in Minnesota. Um, and we're doing a data, we're doing a communicating forecast workshop. Althea is also giving a talk. Um, we like to go to conferences. We like, we just like to, join different groups, talk to you. Yeah, I don't know anything to add, Althea. Yeah. That's it, I think I put the, I put our contact in the, met, it, well, although it didn't really paste correctly there. Oh, I don't know why, it's not really um, linking correctly, but the, our email address is there and that reaches the whole group. So um, we try to turn around responses to those within a few working days, business days. Great. I can include that and in, in several of the resources and links you guys shared um, in their follow-up follow-up email to all of our registrants today. Okay. So awesome. um, thank huge you. thank you to you, Althea, UC, and everyone who joined us today. Uh, this was fantastic. I know I'm leaving with a lot of inspiration. Um, I'm going to pop up a brief poll. Um, would really appreciate if folks can take that before they hop off to let us know how we did today and how we can do better. Um, and yeah, thank, thanks again uh, and look forward to uh, staying in touch with you guys and seeing your work. Thank right. you so much. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Care. Have a great rest of your day.